Welcome to the Investor Coaching Show. Here's your host, Paul Winkler. All right, we're back here on the Investor Coaching Show. Paul Winkler, along with Michael Sharpneck, talking money and investing. You make dig made a comment, Michael, about something you might want to avoid. Mm -hmm. I didn't really thought a whole lot about it. I remember there used to be a guy that did a show on the topic of crowdfunding. Mm -hmm you know, years ago. And it was a radio podcast. There are probably plenty of them out there still. Um, what about, I, I don't know a whole lot about, I, I would hear this guy talk about to some extent, but crowdfunding, younger people, what? What's going on there? Yeah, I've come, came across this recently. Um, there's a lot of these newer um, investing programs, um, online investing platforms and apps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've heard of like Robinhood and, and some of these, but but there's ones that are specifically focusing on crowdfunding. It's it's not necessarily a newer concept, but they've kind of repackaged it. Okay. Um, uh, Fundrise is one of these companies, Realty Mogul. Um, there's, there's quite a few of these. So is it, and I'm going to throw my ignorance out here. From what I understand, somebody comes up with a product idea, typically, and then what happens is they say, hey, I've got this product idea. I'll let you in on the ground floor of this deal. They may not pay you any return, but you might get like free copy of the product or something like that if it actually comes to fruition, or you'll get a subscription for a period of time. Or maybe you'll get a discount or isn't that kind of, you know, there's something in it for you. Yeah. Albeit it doesn't seem to me that it's like an investment thing most of the time. It the, So they have a really wide range of products that you can get through. A lot of these are focused on real estate actually and really yeah and they're, on they're real estate on real estate um and they're they're actually repackaging um they're kind of remarketing reits um essentially a, a lot of them are they, they call them e reits so electronic reits um and and they've but they the, some of them are, are, are kind okay. of avoiding that word even though essentially that's what it is but it's it's essentially what they're marketing it as is like um, you know, the, the wealthy invest in real estate, you know, all successful people have real estate <sighs> oh my and, goodness. and, you know, but traditionally you need hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to even start getting in on it. Uh huh. So we can crowdfund and, you know, you have a thousand little guys with a hundred dollars instead of one guy with a hundred thousand dollars. And you all are able to then crowdfund that money and, and take part in investing in different real estate projects. See, I always get a kick out of that. The wealthy do this. Mm -hmm. And I, so often I have talked about on this show, if you follow the wealthy and how they invest in the stock market or how they invest in general, <laughs> you'd be in big trouble. Yep. <laughs> you, yep. you know, because you look at the growth of just the lower performing area of the market, the S&P 500. You know, if you look at that over 20, 30 years, and you look at the difference between that and the growth and the wealth of the wealthiest people in the world, you'll notice that the market beats them. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it doesn't surprise me that they try to market based on that association, guilt by association, I guess we come back, you know. It's, right, yeah. It's, 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 we, come, we come back to that. In, but, but, but in reality, I think that the problem is it is so, there is so much risk of fraud mm -hmm. in that particular yes. area. From what I've seen, like the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, I think even talks about this to some extent. But the idea is, are they really going to come through as a kind of a promise? And is it really a legitimate thing for investing for your future? Uh, I like learning from other people's mistakes as much as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an area where younger people that are looking at this as a as an investment option, really ought to look at it and go, you know what, this kind of stuff has been done and tried before. It doesn't usually lead to much of anything that's worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, there's a huge amount of risk in it. I, I think younger people are really enamored by real estate in general right now. Um, it's It's been so hot recently that they're really, um, they think that they can try to get in on it and, and, and want to, um, get which, the returns which there. is so interesting because it's cooled down. Yeah. It's yeah. like it's like every other trend we've ever seen where people don't get interested until 
the horses out of the barn. Right, at the peak. People did not get interested in technology stocks in the 90s until it was like 1998, 1999. I remember watching TV and just shaking my head and going, "This uh, this is unreal. Now, when you see these big news channels on finance and they are reporting to you what a select sector is doing all the time and new mutual funds are coming out in that particular area all the time, you know you're probably at a peak. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's, you ought to be going, you know, I think I'm going to back away from this. And, you know, you, you take the real estate profession. I was talking to a real estate agent and I was asking about the, um, the commission thing. Uh, he says, we're not really at risk personally at, in terms of how the real estate commission, because what they're doing is they're saying that these different entities in the real estate industry are colluding to keep the real estate commissions high and there ought to be more flexibility. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, if everybody's setting prices, then government doesn't necessarily get terribly excited about that. But what he said is we have always been flexible. We have always been negotiable. And that's the key. Well, if you have a lot of negotiating going on in that particular area, that real estate business, and let's say that there's less marketing of it being done because you've negotiated the benefits of selling the real estate down, that could have an effect. Interest rates having an effect for sure, as the interest rates have actually increased on mortgages. Uh, A lot of the deals are being done with cash now because people just simply don't even want to finance. Well, people run out of cash after a while. Uh, you know, you have uh, overbuilding in so many different cities around the country where they've overbuilt for the actual demand for real estate. Uh, at some point, what happens, is, and, you know, there have been builders doing this. I don't know if you noticed this, Michael, but what is happening with the builders around the country is they have actually put into the price of the project the financing mm-hmm. And they actually have lower financing costs than if you went out and bought an existing home. So that has actually driven the increase in the amount of inventory of brand new property. And you get more supply. What do you get when you have demand, which is staying the same, let's say? You you get nothing but a drop in prices. You know, so I think that that is quite often the case that people do get all enamored with something mm-hmm. like that, and then it's usually at the wrong time. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and and that's one of the things they're doing with it too. Is is you may not have to invest directly in the real estate, but the debt. So you're actually they're crowdfunding the builder who's financing, you know, a, some commercial building project. Mm-hmm. You become the one who's lending. You know, you're crowdfunding the lending to that builder um, to build their project. You're crowdfunding the lending to yeah. build the project. That just makes me nervous even thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. But, you know, that is, I think, just keep your eye on this, folks. Anything like that, private equity, in private equity is another mm-hmm. thing that comes to mind. Yep. When you don't have a lot of regulation, let me just put it this way. A lot of times we buck against regulation. We say it's a bad thing and it's terrible. But in, in investing, it really does protect investors. When companies have to put their data together, they got to put their balance sheets together, they got to put their financial information in there, they got to they put all of what they're doing out there to be scrutinized by a potential investor so that when they put out the documents for you know, for you know, for a prospectus or, or whatever, uh, then people can look at it and go, is this thing legitimate? When you have something like crowdfunding or private equity, you just have such a dark glass that you're looking through. You don't really know what you're buying. And we don't know what you're buying. And when things are being hidden, it's ripe for you paying way too much for that thing that you're buying. And it's ripe for you, list, you, you know, losing money because you didn't know really what you had. You have all these um, companies that are marketing the, uh, to younger people, mm-hmm. all these investments. One of the things that it made me think of like uh, Taco Bell, mm-hmm. um, think outside the bun. They're, they're <laughs> trying to get you to think outside of stocks and traditional investing. And, yeah. and I was, I was yeah, in, in that, <laughs> oh yeah, alter, alternative yeah. investments. Yes. yes, yes, that was that was the hot thing around 2009, and and you saw commodities being included in that, and so much of that stuff just just absolutely tore up people's portfolios, and most of them they don't know about it because they don't realize it because they don't look at their statements. 
they don't even know what happened to them is what I find. But mm. yeah, when you see alternatives, you see commodities, you need to see that type of thing in your investment portfolio, go, private equity, you go, oh, All of that. what is this person doing? And I'm not paying any attention. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, it, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, you talk about um, mm-hmm. being uh, in finance, kind of like being in a time machine. You know, yes. it's, it's kind of interesting for me being a younger person <laughs> yeah. in the finance industry and meeting with people of all ages and seeing oh. the different perspectives. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's these these things that are being marketed, these alternative investments, these real estate, this essentially repackaged REITs. Um, it's nothing new, but it's being marketed to younger people as if it's this new, hot, trendy thing that mm-hmm. you can get into, even though it's just something that's been around for a long time. Yeah, it, there is nothing new under the sun. There have always been things, because if you look at the data on returns that have investors have gotten investing in, in markets in general or investing just period, it's it's abysmal. And I saw somebody brought in a statement and uh, it was a very small account. Uh, and, and they had a bunch of bigger, you know, bigger things going on. They had some real estate investments and, and you know, some personal property and things like that, that they were going to sell and downsize and and they were going to be okay, but it just amazed me the stuff that they had done in the stock market. It was in investments, and they said, "Well, you know, this thing was uh, about the same account value about twenty years ago, mm-hmm. <laughs> about twenty three years and twenty five years ago, or something like that. I can't remember the exact number of years, but it was the same amount." And I was all I could think of is who on earth was watching. <laughs> and paying attention to this thing. Right. And, you know, it was uh, basically moved, money was moved into places at really bad times and people chasing markets and chasing returns and, and they end up being being destroyed by it. So, yeah. Uh, but that, you know, that's, I, I think that that is there's certainly nothing new under the sun and there's certainly that aspect where people repeat these repeat these things. I remember early on, we would go and walk people through the types of risk. I used to do this regularly with people 20 years ago (laughs) when I was setting up doing a lot of paperwork and setting up accounts. I would bring people through the different types of risk. And I would talk about how we're avoiding those risks, Uh, liquidity risk, you know, and and I would talk about, and and if you look at these these types of things, liquidity risk is a huge huge deal, right? You know, I can invest, I can put my money in it, but I can, can I turn it back into money? Can I pull it back out and turn it into money? Uh, you talk about uh, the the costs, you know, what are the costs to get in? What are the costs to get out? Mm-hmm. I don't know exactly how that works, but I would expect that there is some significant drag in that particular area that has not even been looked at by the regulators necessarily because it's such a small thing. Right. And it won't be really looked at until people have really lost a tremendous amount of money is what I my experience with regulators, you know, look at what has been happening happened in the past in the investing world and typically things don't get fixed until a lot of people have lost a lot of money. Sure. Uh I was just looking online about it. It's the cancellation restrictions. Mm-hmm. Once you make an investment commitment for a regulation crowded crowdfund and offering, you'll be committed to make the investment unless you cancel your commitment. I didn't realize that that was a thing. Mm. That was that was under the SEC website. Uh, valuation capitalization. I already covered that. I'm just looking at the SEC website on the thing and valuation capitalization. Uh, it's how do you value this stuff? Remember right. back in 2008, we went through this whole mess in 2008 and you had this marked to market. Nobody had even heard the term before, hardly. And the idea of mark to market was what is this supposed to be actually worth? And so many of the investments had a much higher value on paper than you could actually sell them for. You know, so what ended up happening is you had properties, banks had properties. And on their books, the property was worth a high number. And in reality, because they couldn't liquidate it because nobody could buy anything, because of what was going on in the economy and what was happening in the banking system, nobody could actually pay. And that's when you had TARP, when the, go- when the government basically came in and bought up the properties. And it's funny because the government actually made money on TARP, which everybody thought that's the worst thing ever. But they bought the properties for a, for a song and a dance. And then when the economy recovered and everything got better, they got their money back. 
But that was a huge risk at that point in time because nobody really knew it was going to happen. Uh, another thing they bring up, limited disclosure. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you don't have SEC documentation. An uh, early stage company may be able to provide only limited information about its business plan. You don't know. It's just you're, you're throwing your money in a black hole. Investment in personnel. Early stage is also an investment in the entrepreneur. That's who's benefiting the greatest amount with this. Right. Them and the companies making the the markup, you know, the, the kind of the, the marketplace of it. And, and uh, you know, in, in private equity sees somewhat of the same type of thing. It can mm -hmm. be very, very fraught with risk. Possibility of fraud. They, I brought that up already. Lack of professional guidance. Yeah, of course. You know, you don't really know what you're getting. And, and even the people that are guiding you to it don't really know what is going to happen. It's very, very... It's Wild West. It, it is. And, the, and they'll have on their, you know, they'll have courses, you know, on these platforms for how to how to do it. And, and they they try to teach you that you can kind of become this expert. You can you can get in there and and kind of, um, you know, take advantage of, of what other people are missing, you know, in these things. And it's um, it, it's it's really all we talked about thanksgiving thankfulness some of that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um you know it's really all playing on this desire to like you know want more get ahead get rich um, yeah get rich quick exactly kind right. of the opposite of that which warren buffett said you know get rich slowly and yep. you know who got rich right. <laughs> the guy that thought differently yep <laughs> yep and and you know and and i think that that's a key point just to remember that why is it that people do that? Sometimes they do it because they, they feel like they're behind. Sometimes they do feel like nobody notices them, that nobody cares about them, but they'll care about me all of a sudden if I'm rich and if I'm popular because, look, the rich people are being paid attention to, and it's that desire for something. And quite often, if we really want to be well-liked, we want to be loved, uh, I love that one book, What Happy People Know, says, no, be the one that gives love. You know, Because if you're giving love, if you don't, if you need to be loved, you're in trouble because if somebody decides not to give you love, you're you're lost. But if you're the one initiating that, then what happens? And if you're just doing, and I love what a pastor friend of mine said one time. He says, "I'm not a public speaker. You know who I'm talking about." Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jerry just made this. He we always yep. say this, right? He said, "I'm not a public speaker," and we go like, "How do you get up there and do the sermon every week? How do you do that, man?" Mm -hmm. And he go, "I just love on people." I'm up here. I'm going to stand up here. I'm going to just love on people. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole thing. And everybody loved, loves them as, as a result of it. Yeah. Uh, for, I've, I've heard someone say, um, you know, people are so interested in like, what are, what are my gifts and, and what are, and it's like, if you think about how like other people and how you can benefit other people, mm -hmm. there's your gifts. Like they, they pop up in that, you know, when you, when you stop mm. being inward focused on that and you turn it outward. Yeah. Um, yeah. A friend of mine used to put it this way. It said, you know, if somebody was in trouble and they needed something really bad, what would they count on you for? Mm. What mm -hmm. would they turn to you for that you seem to do or seem to do effortlessly or the things that you think everybody ought to be able to do this? And you think that because you're able to do it really, really well. Mm-hmm.